Sure, you've played scratch-offs, but you haven't played anything like our newest $20 Ohio Lottery scratch-offs. There's mega cash with a $500 instant prize and minimum payouts of at least $30. And Magnificent Millions, which has over $58 million in total prizes. Both scratch-offs have a whopping $2 million top prize. So play Mega Cash at Magnificent Millions from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Play responsibly. At Progressive, we know there's nothing like the feeling of riding a motorcycle with your crew on the open road. That symphony of engines roaring in perfect harmony. It's a feeling that would be impossible to recreate on the radio. Until now. Hit it, Jerry. Oh, my word. Really, really terrible. Was that a glockenspiel, Jerry? Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Uh, no, no, Jerry. It's over. Hey, this is Stuart Wright, your host, cutting in to let you know that on this podcast episode, Neil Marshall will be previewing the world premiere of The Lair, which plays at Fright Fest. He also looks back on the 20th anniversary of Dog Soldiers and the release of the 4K restoration. We talked to him about his abiding memories of getting that film made, shooting that movie, and the reception it received. And as a bonus... We also get to speak to Keith Bell, the producer of Dog Soldiers, about his abiding memories too. Over to the filmmakers. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today I've got with me Neil Marshall. Welcome to the show. Hello. And welcome back, I should say. Good to be back in Blighty. I've, I've been away for a few months. And weirdly, like, because I was in Tenerife for the summer making a movie, and it's hotter coming back here. It's Fright Fest, and you've got a world premiere for your film, The Lair. Do you want to give us a brief synopsis about what The Lair is? First of all, like I'm so chuffed that the world premiere is at Fright Fest. I mean, that just makes my day, because you know, Fright Fest hosted the world premiere of uh, Descent and, 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 and such like. So it was like, yeah, to, to bring it back here, um, to be playing... You know, uh, it, it was the Empire. I keep on calling it the Empire Leicester Square, but it's not the Empire anymore. anymore. But the IMAX Leicester Square um, is amazing. But the, yeah, the lair is, um, and it does hark back to uh, the likes of Dog Soldiers and Descent in that it's a much more kind of fun ride of gore and action and stuff. It's, um, it's set in Afghanistan uh, in 2017. And it's about a British fighter pilot who gets uh, shot down by insurgents and takes refuge in what turns out to be a very old Russian uh, black site bunker and uh, inadvertently awakens this experiment that they were messing around with. Turns out the Russians had their very own Roswell and, uh, and, it, and it happened in the Hindu Kush and they were fucking around with stuff down there. And uh, and she reawakens this thing and uh, or, or these things I should say and um, and they come out for, for for hunting and killing and eating and such like and uh, and she takes she also she manages to get picked up by an American team and they take her back to the base and then all hell breaks loose after that. And what what was the initial kernel of an idea that led to a film led to that film which was seen at Fright Fest? It initially started during uh, during COVID lockdowns in LA. Right. That a friend of mine approached me and said, well, you know, I know some friends who've got a house in the desert and like, if we could put together something really small, could we do a film that was like in the house in the desert, like something happening there, like a horror film. And the idea just like really grew from there was like, well, I fancied doing something in the desert. And if we had a small cast in a relatively contained location, maybe we can do it kind of during COVID. As, as happens to all my scripts, it just kind of, exploded it just kind of went bigger and bigger and bigger and suddenly it was like then it became afghanistan then it became russians then it became bunkers and soldiers and uh and you know and aliens and all that kind of stuff um but we still managed to do it during covid and we still managed to keep it relatively contained you know we shot it out in budapest weirdly not the, not the most obvious choice for afghanistan but you know it's amazing what you can do these days 
Um, cause we'd done the, we'd done the reckoning out there and we had a, a bunch of contacts and we knew it was a good tax credit and all this kind of stuff. So we ended up going back to Budapest and shooting it there. And it, it actually, it actually worked very, very well. Um, with the, with the help of some visual effects, of course. Indeed. Well, that's a lovely segue. What was your, uh, what was your favorite memory from the shoot? Favorite memory from the shoot? I mean, I, I don't know. Cause like one of the things was like virtually every day was action stuff, but we, we did one scene where I don't want to give too much away, but it's, you know, it starts off as essentially kind of a dialogue scene, but then very suddenly turns into absolute chaos. Mm. Um, and that ends with some explosion thing. And just filming that scene with all the actors was absolutely hilarious, just because it's just organized chaos, just letting them letting them go in this scene and just seeing what happened was, was a lot of fun. And of course, it ended up with everybody being showered with blood, which is always fun. Can you, can you remember what were the sort of added challenges that COVID presented then for, for the shoot? Well, we, we got incredibly lucky. Um, I mean, it was in the height of COVID, uh, one of the many lockdowns or, or, or you know, resurgences um, of the summer of uh, 2021. And, uh, you know, we were doing testing every day and, you know, managed to somehow get through without getting it. One of our cast members got it two days after we wrapped. But on the film I've just done in Tenerife, uh, both myself and Charlotte both got COVID during the shoot. And we had to we had to figure a way through it that way, which made things that were already difficult even more difficult. But with with the lair, uh, miraculously nobody nobody came down with COVID during the whole shoot, which was a miracle. By avoiding any spoilers, what's the scene you're most looking forward to seeing with the Fright Fest audience? Well, possibly the one I mentioned, but there's also I don't know, there's two or three moments in it that I think I can't wait for the Fright Fest guys to 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 see it. But, uh, but it's not, not necessarily just like horror stuff. There's some lines of dialogue in there, which I'm hoping will really hit with a, a UK audience. You know, I think inherently my sense of humor is kind of, you know, has a kind of UK bent to it. I guess just appealing to those more like myself than say a US audience um, in, in just the use of language and the use of humor. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing it for the first time with a, with a full UK audience, you know. Fantastic. Well, look, um, also at Fright Fest is going to be the 4K restoration of Dog Soldiers, which is a, it's the 20th anniversary of your debut feature film. And I thought it'd be fun to uh, maybe draw on three memories from Dog Soldiers for the, uh, for the Britflix audience. So if I can start you at the top, what's, what's a memory you can think of about trying to get the film made? Obviously, a first film is an important step for any director. So what can you remember of that process? What I remember about it was it was a long, you know, long process. It was six years, and uh, from writing it to getting it actually on, you know, to filming it, yeah. and then seven to get it on the screen. But um, such a long process, and there was a lot of stories along the way. Of you know, I remember like signing contracts in a rainy doorway in Soho, like uh, you know, because everything everything was so ad hoc. Yeah. Um. Or, or going out to Bray Studios to meet some werewolf designers there. And just the fact that I got, got to go to Bray Studios was just like, oh my God, this is like Hammer Town, you know, this is amazing. <laughs> um, you know, we scouted locations in the Isle of Man at one point because we thought we were going to make it there, but that never came off. We we looked at Canada and then ended up going to um, you know, Luxembourg in the end. So like it was such a it was such a road to get to where mm. we are, where we where we got to. Um, I don't know if there's any one memory and beyond. Well, I mean, the, uh, the origin of the whole thing was that myself and uh, Keith Bell, who produced it, and a friend of ours uh, called Colin Lang, who's, who did the very first sketches of the werewolves hmm. um, for us, uh, we went to the Highlands of Scotland because uh, Keith was working in Glasgow. So we all went up to see him and we took a drive up to the Highlands of Scotland and we ended up getting very, very drunk in a, in a pub on the shores of Loch Fine uh, and uh, drinking whiskey and smoking cigars. And Keith drafted out a, a, a contract on a napkin, which basically said that he agreed to, to produce the film, that I agreed to direct the film, and we both signed it there and then. And that was that was kind of how it all started. Like the Happy Mondays moment in uh, 24 Hour Party, people. It was a bit like that, yeah. It was a bit <laughs> like that. It was unplanned and just bizarre and, and wonderful. <laughs> What's an abiding memory of the shoot? Um, again, so many memories. I mean, you know, we we had one night because we were filming. I can't remember when we were filming in Luxembourg, but like 
one night it just decided to dump like eight inches of snow on us while we were filming. And of course that would have completely destroyed the continuity. Uh, so we had it, we were like, we built a barn that we were going to blow up and we literally just said, shit, let's just roll the, the, roll the Land Rover into the barn and we'll turn it into the studio for the night. And we all just sat on hay bales and filmed all the interior Land Rover stuff and just had people shaking the Land Rover and stuff like that while it was like absolutely, you know, Arctic outside. No way. And we kind of thought we were really, we thought we were really screwed then because it was going to stick around for a while. It would have just fucked with our continuity, but it was gone the next day. It was just like, boom, came, went. But that night was a lot of fun just sitting in this barn you know, on the hay bales, making a little movie around this Land Rover with all the cast inside. And that's, you know, when we, that, that line, you know, it's uh, fucking, fucking great hairy things chasing us <laughs> or whatever. It's like. um, all that stuff was in, in the barn, you know, the barn studio. So, so here we are in the, in the, having the 20th anniversary and obviously 4K restoration and Janine Pipes busy writing the sausages and making of dog soldiers. But what do you yeah. remember about the reception and seeing your debut feature on the big screen? Um, well, the, the, the premiere of Dog Soldiers took place up in Newcastle. Um, so it was with a, a, like a home audience. So all the cast came up and stuff like that. And we had it in what was the uh, Odeon Cinema in Newcastle. It's now since been demolished, hmm. very sadly, because that was the film that I first saw Star Wars and Raiders and all these amazing films you wow. know, in my teenage years. Um, it was amazing old Art Deco Odeon. And then uh, about a month after... We had our premiere there. It got closed down, and and now it's been demolished. It's all gone. But uh, to have the premiere there and play it with an audience of locals and friends and family and stuff like that was was an incredible experience, and everybody had a blast. And then uh, you know, then getting to take it essentially kind of around the world for the first time of like going to the festival circuit and going to Europe and all over the place to play this movie was you know an astonishing experience. And now to think, you know, like if you'd have to be then, you know, are people still going to be? Talking about this movie in 20 years, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have believed it, but here we are. And um, having a, a, you know, coming back to Fright Fest, and it's just amazing to be showing it. And because uh, I've helped supervise the restoration and been involved in approving all that kind of stuff, because mm. what had happened was they lost the negative. The, leg the negative of the movie had vanished. Oh, wow. And that's why the, the previous version that came out on Blu ray was not a fully restored version. It wasn't 4K. It was just from a print that I had. Hmm. But this new version went back to the neg and they cleaned it all up and it just looks so beautiful. I mean, considering it was shot on Super 16 as well. Hmm. Like it, it looks gorgeous. So I just can't wait to see so it. So did, did, how did you find the negative? Did was was that just did it just come up? Or uh, was... Well, it wasn't it wasn't me. It was Christopher Fig, the producer, who somehow managed to locate it. I mean, it wow. took them some time, but they, I think it was it was at the lab where it was meant to be. I think they just mislaid it somehow or mislabeled it or something or other, but they found it. And that's the main thing. Cause it's kind of scary for a little independent films. I think there's always, you know, they, they don't have the studio backup system that, that, mm. that of, of preserving everything. It's like, if something goes missing, it you know, you know, gets lost, it could be lost forever. And, uh, and these are, these are precious things, you know? Indeed. No. And, and so finally then on that, what, what was, the, when you're restoring a film like this and you go back to the negative, what, what were you able to do today that you weren't able to do then? Well, obviously, just there's just the quality is just so much better. It's not when it becomes the, the 4K digital process. Yeah, there's no loss. There's no generation losses from going from like print to print or copying prints in, in the same way. Hmm. So, uh, so that's incredible. There's just just the, the the transfer of quality from. There's no image loss between the negative and the final 4K. Hmm. So it's that's that's the thing, and the color, the colors, and everything else. It's just. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing to see. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Well, look, one last question. What's your number one film festival tip for rookies attending Fright Fest? You know, it's a great the thing is it's a great opportunity to meet filmmakers, um, to see films you've never heard of before and filmmakers you've never heard of before and give new filmmakers a chance. Um, but just to, to to be amongst your own kind is is you know, is is the biggest deal, I think, of, of when you go there, you realize Oh, I, I, I'm not this like crazy person who likes these films. There's loads of us, and we all share the same passion, you know, for horror and fantasy and and such like. And it's like, yeah, it's you go there, you go to Fright Fest to know you're not alone. Indeed, indeed. Well, look, thanks very much for giving your time on the Bitflix podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. 
And as a bonus, we've got Keith Bell, producer of Dog Soldiers, to share with us his, his three memories from the film. Welcome to the show, Keith. Morning, Stuart. No, it's good to be here. Good to be here. Twenty years after, twenty years after its release, and you've got a four K, you got a four K restoration at Fright Fest. Well, it's always good to celebrate that. It's always good. Always good. What's an abiding memory about trying to get Dog Soldiers made? The thing that always sticks in my head about the beginnings of Dog Soldiers is a little bit of backstory. Very briefly, Neil and I had met at kind of film school in Newcastle. He was in the area above me. I immediately saw he was a great talent. He was doing zombie film, breaking all the rules, doing some fabulous stuff, brain death. Um, I did my film. We both graduated. I went to London. He stayed editing in the Northeast. Came back a few years later and we both worked on a low budget film in Newcastle. And on, that, on the set of that film, we both said, we should do this. We should make a film together. Um, I took a job for the BBC up in Scotland and about six months after that, he came up and he said, look, I've got a script. Do you want to talk about it? And that script was Dog Soldiers. And that was back in 1996. Fast forward a couple of months, he was coming up to Scotland. We would go up with friends. We'd do a mountain together. We'd come up on one of the trips. We'd been up this hill. We'd come back. We were staying at this hotel. We got- We're always celebrating something in summer. Weddings, birthdays, showers, graduations, Wednesdays. The list goes on. And finding the perfect gift for those celebrations can be tough. Or at least it was. Because now there's Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on the largest selection of beer, wine, and spirits, then send them to that special someone in under 60 minutes. Or scheduled up to two weeks in advance. It's basically the ultimate gifting cheat code, because drinks are basically the ultimate gift. Think about it. When's the last time you returned alcohol? Never? Exactly. So if you're looking to spend more time celebrating and less time gift shopping, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com to find their favorite drinks without breaking the bank today. Sure, you've played scratch-offs, but you haven't played anything like our newest $20 Ohio Lottery scratch-offs. There's mega cash with a $500 instant prize and minimum payouts of at least $30. And Magnificent Millions, which has over $58 million in total prizes. Both scratch-offs have a whopping $2 million top prize. So play mega cash at Magnificent Millions from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Play responsibly a lot to drink and I signed I basically signed a contract on a napkin promising at something like two o'clock in the morning with plenty of whiskey and Guinness and everything inside us promising to say look I promise I will produce Neil Marshall's feature film Dog Sons and that was probably around 1997 um, and from then and this is a valuable lesson to anybody then it was we had a script which we were happy with, not the first draft. I think we've gone through about five or six drafts before we did it. But the thing that always sticks in my head is how everybody turned it down. We showed it to everybody who was anybody in the British film industry, from your Tim and Eric at working title to every other production company going. We had uh, Film 4, we had you know all the, all the usual suspects, and nobody, nobody wanted touch horror. Nobody wanted to touch a first-time director. Nobody wanted to do a kind of werewolf comedy. Nobody. Just the lack of ambition and the lack of um, just commerciality. Just They just didn't see it. They just didn't see it. And that was tough. And it is tough. It's tough for anybody trying to get the over, idea over the line. And years went by. Literally, years would go by where we would literally keep going, keep going. And that's the thing with this business. You have to have a resilience that you get a rejection and you just get up and you go back again. One of the, I don't think he's known some hero, but one of the great heroes of the project was a guy called Vic Bateman, who ran a sales company, um, the Victor Film Company. And he, he was the only one who saw the potential of that idea, saw the potential in Neil as a writer director. And he said to me, he said, Keith, I want to do this. I think we can get it made. Nobody's made a good werewolf movie since The Howling. And we just kept going. And through Big, we brought on other producers, brought on Christopher Big, who did 
Hellraiser, who was really useful. And from then, it was literally just trying and trying and trying to get trying to get it made. And just that sense of everybody turned it down. I'll hold my hand up. I nearly quit two or three times. I was supplementing my income by working in commercials, um, working for an advertising agency, and just to keep the money coming in, but also keep in the business. And I used their office for fax machines and sending stuff out, stuff like that. This is kind of late 90s. And Neil was supplementing his income by editing stuff. And we just kept going. And I think it was partly Neil's bloody mindedness just to get it over the line. He wouldn't quit. He was, he was adamant he was going to get it made. And we just got to the point where we kept going, kept going. And, and finally, through Vic, David E. Allen looked at the uh, synopsis, looked at the script, really liked the idea and wanted to do a werewolf film and came over to the UK looked at it and the next and then we went off to uh, then we went off to Luxembourg. So it was those everybody when you talk about film you tend to talk about uh the shoot because that's where all the stories happen with the actors and everybody and, and the reception and stuff like that. But that huge chunk of filmmaking which is rejection, rejection, rejection. Nobody wants it. And sticking by your idea, looking at the idea and going, can I make it better? Can I can I do can I do more with it? Why are people turning it down? Do I stick to my guns? That that is my that is my memory of dog soldiers because it, it yeah it doesn't surprise me. And the weird thing is, twenty years later, very little has changed. What what's an abiding memory of the shoes? My biggest memory on on the shoot of dog soldiers was this. Um, I've worked I've worked since the early nineties. I've done all sorts. I've done TV, I've done reality, I've done current affairs, I've done animation, I've done short films, I've done, uh, I did low budget features. Obviously, I've worked with Neil on Dosso and Descent. Um, I've worked on bigger feature films like Tournament and Harry Brown and other stuff. But the one thing that sticks with me is I've never worked on anything where the cast and the crew bonded so well and had a total mindset of getting this over the line and working on something that they kind of realized, not straight away when they signed on the dotted line to do the job, but they realized what a, what an amazing project it was. And I think, I always think when you see a great film and you hear of all the bad stories and the crazy stories that went on and something like Apocalypse Now or Fitzgerald or you look, you look at those films and go, the crew were in mutiny and it was still, but they was, there's just a, there's a greatness in them because people, blood, sweat and tears went into making it. We, we didn't have nightmares. We had, it was, it was so much fun. I think part of it was probably because we'd been through that journey and trying to get it made, but it was just the, the affinity and the, the closeness that Neil and I and the rest of the crew bonded with the actors was just, Unbelievable. We we work really hard all day in the mud uh, and the blood, and then we come back to the hotel and we we shower, get changed, go down the go down the, pub, uh, the bar, have a few drinks, have some of the week, and get on like a house on fire. And it was just so much fun. There's so much laughs, and I think that kind of closeness was it was just unreal. And I've never never been never wanted to recreate it but that's no disrespect to anybody who's worked with me on any other project because those, those projects have their own benefits as well it's just with that the, the thing that i will always remember about making dog so was going to luxembourg shooting in the woods of luxembourg uh, and then shooting in the studio there was just going to work every morning and the crew which would tend to be quite a young crew they had smiles on their faces. We got on. The laughter that permeated that set was just great. Everybody kind of got into it and just bought into this kind of crazy, kind of UK werewolf idea. Um, and the and the cast. I mean, Sean. I remember being in a bar in in Luxembourg uh, after first week, and uh, we done we shot the first week. So, so we went out that last week Friday. We had the Saturday off, and then we started shooting on the Sunday again. 
And we bonded, and we bonded so well, we were kind of throwing the drink around and stuff. And Sean was on the phone, and he said, Keith, speak, speak here, speak. And he was on the phone to Jude, Jude Law. And um, obviously, Sean and Jude were in a company together at that point, a company called Natural Nylon, with a number of other actors, Johnny Lee Miller and others. And um, Jude said to me, he said, Keith, he said, thanks for getting my mate back. He said, I've never heard him talk about a film like this in years. He said, I thought he was going to, you know, he said it was, he said, it's great to hear that passion again in his voice. And I thought maybe it's a drink talking, but maybe we're doing something that we don't realize what we've, what we've done. So that, that, that sort of why to leave that kind of courage under fire, that whole kind of atmosphere. That's, that's the abiding memory. The, the laps we had on that, on that shoot, you know, in the middle of Europe, uh, which just have always stayed with me, and and that's the things you remember twenty years later. Right? And what do you remember about the reception and seeing your debut feature sort of hit the screens? I think when a film is made, when it's done, when you when it's finished, when the distributors come on and said, "Right, it's over to us now. We're going to put it on two hundred and fifty screens," you then realise an entirely different industry takes over your thing that you've worked really really hard. On. And you kind of go, wow, you're, you've made this film, you've been talking about it with friends and family and pulled them into submission for years. And then they start realizing what you've done. And they go, I've just driven past a bus shelter with a with a, a, a poster for dogs. So that's your film, that's your film. I said, yeah, it's coming out in two weeks. Um, so you realize, you realize that. But the thing that always stays with me, and I think more filmmakers do it, is... On the opening night of Dogs Love, the opening night of Cafe releasing the film in the UK, a lot of filmmakers go, right, I've seen the film on a big screen because I went to the premiere or I went to the cast and crew and I went to this. Uh, myself and my former wife drove to our local UCI cinema, parked the car, walked in and paid money for tickets. We got there quite early and I sat about three or four rows from the back. Not my usual sitting position in a in a in a cinema, but I wanted to be I wanted to be close to it because I didn't really want to watch the film. She didn't need it. She'd seen it three times. Um I wanted to see the audience and I wanted to watch the audience react. And that comes from my previous life, long before I went to film school, I was a cinema manager. And that's kind of it was my entry level uh into the industry. So that was the most nervous and the most the sense of trepidation in the entire five years of making that film because you're at the mercy of the people buying the tickets and you're at the mercy of the more people buy tickets, the, the more box office you've got, the more box office you can get, the better financial position you will be after the opening weekend. And it means you will not just disappear after one week in the cinema, you will have Two, two weeks, maybe three weeks, and heaven forbid, four weeks. This was a slightly different industry 20 years ago because we're not into streaming and stuff like that. So your theatrical, your cinema experience was crucial to build sales for obviously DVD and TV rights further down the line. And I counted every single person who walked through the door behind me into that cinema. And it got busier and busier and busier. And funnily enough, Neil on the other side of the country in Carlisle was doing exactly the same. <laughs> he was he'd gone to the he'd gone to the open night, he was watching the audience, he was looking at the crowd. And um the film started and I could hear the music, but I'm not looking at the screen, I'm looking ahead and I'm looking around and I'm going, right, there's some couples there, there's a bunch of guys on their own. So the younger crowd, there's an older crowd. What's the demographic? What's the kind of sense of um, feedback? What's the reactions like? And a, a sound that is unique to cinema is when laughter starts. Comedy is really hard. And if you can get laughs, you can get chuckles, you can get that knowing kind of you can sense a smile. And I thought, they're buying into this. They're getting into it. And the general, the vast 
the vast majority, um, the reaction was extremely good, extremely good. There's a couple of little Jordy nods in there as well because we're watching it Newcastle, um, where um, oh the line. Um, do you know what the score was? And she goes, I, I didn't know there was a game on. And he goes, it's not a game. And you could tell the kind of probably Toon fans in the crowd sort of doing no and yeah, rumble, rumble. And, I, and there was a chuckle to that because the reaction. Um, and it was just fabulous watching the film with a paying audience because it's a different audience than acolytes and friends and family cast and crew aren't going to poo-poo their own film. Mm. They're, they're, going to, they're going to look at their own film and go, yeah. Um, if, if you've been given tickets, if it's a kind of, you know, thing, but if it's, a, if it's a screening where you pay to go and it's, it's been advertised as this, 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 that's the true test. And as I said, incredibly nervous, came away feeling relieved, went home and looked back, back then, you know, we would get the reports on how well we'd done on Friday, how well we'd done on Saturday, how well we'd do on the Sunday, and um, it was it was just we'd done we'd done really really well, we'd done really really well, and I think I seem to remember, um, I we went to Cannes, we went to Cannes Film Festival on the we either went on the Saturday or the Sunday, I can't remember, and in Cannes we were told by Pate, the distributor. Um, guys, you've actually done a million dollar weekend. We've done nearly seven hundred thousand pounds, which at that point was uh, the dollar conversion rate was a million dollars. And that convinced the British film industry, convinced the distributors, go, oh, we'll give it week two, we'll give it week three, and and it stayed in the cinemas for a few weeks, which was just was just unheard of for independent British films to do that because a lot of independent British films, and I'm not talking about yet, you. you High budget working title stuff, your Richard Curtis stuff. I'm not talking about the Merchant Ivory stuff, Oscar worthy stuff. I'm talking about low budget, under the radar stuff. Um, you made a film and it was, it was gone in six days. It just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think those are. Those are my memories of dog soldiers. Well, look, thank you for sharing all that with us. That was fantastic. Progressive is America's number one motorcycle insurer, so we understand motorcycles. No, really, we have a bike translator. Uh, okay, this is awkward, but this bike says he'd appreciate it if you removed his skull pattern saddlebags. <laughs> he feels self-conscious about them around all the other bikes, and he says you're not fooling anyone. You mostly ride with your golfing buddies. <laughs> Listen, I'm just the messenger here. Oh, no, I don't want to say that. I think you made yourself clear. Quote with Progressive and see if you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Sure, you've played scratch-offs, but you haven't played anything like our newest $20 Ohio Lottery scratch-offs. Here's Mega Cash with a $500 instant prize and minimum payouts of at least $30. And Magnificent Millions, which has over $58 million in total prizes. Both scratch-offs have a whopping $2 million top prize. So play Mega Cash at Magnificent Millions from the Ohio Lottery, and you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. Lottery players are subject to Ohio laws and commission regulations. Play responsibly.